On this episode, we look at autonomous vehicles and pedestrians. Then we visit Smart Growth America to learn about their new report, Rebuilding Downtown. Stay tuned. We're in Washington, D.C., talking with Barry Weller, who's come down from Ottawa, Canada. What's your connection to transportation issues? I taught transportation course at the University of Ottawa for many, many years. And now that I'm retired from the university as a professor emeritus, I am still doing a considerable amount of consulting work. And I've appeared on a, several occasions as an expert witness in uh, civil actions involving pedestrians and motor vehicles and drivers and motor vehicles. And I think having been qualified as an expert witness, it gives me kind of a different take on how you approach uh, the compilation of evidence to deal with matters that affect pedestrians. And one of the hottest topics right now is autonomous vehicles. Just what is an autonomous vehicle? Uh, that is a term which is undergoing, uh, as is usually the case, uh, a defining process. And the question is, if it's autonomous, is it with or without a driver? They would tend to refer to it as driverless. Uh, but in any effect, what it boils down to is the machine is largely in charge of itself, unless, of course, there happens to be somebody else in the vehicle, and the question is, is the other person in the vehicle liable for anything that the machine might do, which is part of the ongoing debate as to what you actually call an autonomous vehicle, and whether or not it simply is a poor choice of words, and it is a term which, like gridlock, should probably be scrapped because gridlock really is a nonsense term as well. So autonomous vehicles in large measure is, is equated with driverless. Uh, the only thing is, it's not as if there's a bunch of cars uh, driving around with nobody in them. There is somebody in them, and the question is, is the person in the car in effect the driver, whether he or she is behind the wheel or sitting behind the wheel? So it's an evolving piece of terminology, John, but the industry itself is evolving. And all of a sudden we have these vehicles on the road driving themselves more or less. Uh, what issues does that bring up other than what we call them? Well this becomes the the part which is intriguing because one of the things that is a a matter of concern is there are people who simply want to get these things on the road and the question is which is the better or the best technology and there will be uh, different players competing to be able to lay claim to having the best vehicle on the road. This is nothing new from the automobile industry or the, the motorized vehicle industry itself. But for me, the driving issue is the relationship between, so let's call them autonomous or AV, uh, autonomous vehicles, AVs, uh, and pedestrians. That's really the issue that is first and foremost in my mind. And my primary concern here is the seeming multiplicity of questions and the paucity of answers. In effect, lots and lots of questions and almost no answers, at least no answers that I've been able to ascertain as to the significance of autonomous vehicles on the relationship between motorized vehicles and pedestrians. So what I'm thinking of now is an awful lot more attention needs to be paid to developing a research agenda which discusses all of the issues raised well before we hear that very unfortunate oops term, which means who to thunk it. Somebody got killed uh, or injured, which frequently from the point of view of money can cost an awful lot more, and people will say, well, it never occurred to me. And the question is, well, did you ever ask? And that's what I'm getting at here, is some questions need to be asked, uh, some terms of reference need to be set forward before there is any approval of autonomous vehicles on any road that I would ever use and any road that I would ever recommend any other pedestrian ever use. So it's the research agenda that uh, has currently got piqued my interest, John, piqued my interest. What are some of the, the key, key areas of, of, of questions that, that we need to ask? Well, first and foremost, uh, before, we, before we go too far down that road, one of the problems we have is there's always a, a tendency to want to get to ask the, the key questions. And the problem is the answer depends on the expertise of the person involved. And on the one hand, the lay person who might be the regular user of uh, intersections, sidewalks, roads, parking structures, wherever autonomous vehicles might be, uh, these are the people who would have a very different perception, I think, 
than an expert witness because I would look at it from the point of view of liability. I mean, that's what I would be looking at. I would be looking at standard of care, uh, duty of care on the one hand, standard of care on the part of the municipality, and on the part of the private sector. But my, my first inclination is to get a handle on what I would regard as the significance and the magnitude of the problem. And just to put things in context, when we look at relationships between private uh, uh, motorized vehicles and pedestrians, the ages change. There's major difference in ages. There's a major difference in locations. There are major differences in weather. There's a major difference in pedestrian crossing habits, driver habits. So there's, there's dozens, if not hundreds and hundreds of questions that need to be asked and answered before the autonomous vehicles are ever on the road. You know as well as I do that we already have problems in the relationship between pedestrians and motorized vehicles. Well, the question arises, will that relationship change? And if so, how? Well, that question has to be answered before you introduce another variable into the transportation relationship, you better understand what it is you already have and how the introducing of this new capability is going to change things. And in this case, what's the impact on pedestrians, positive or negative? Both of them have to be dealt with. You can't just assume it's going to be negative. There could be some positive features if, for example, it took some terrible drivers off the road. I mean, that would be a, a, a positive aspect. But this all has to be looked at, and I thought, the players in this piece are not minor. Google, major, major, multi-billion dollar enterprise. The car manufacturers, also multi-billion dollar enterprises. And throughout the world, you have, on a daily basis, billions of pedestrians. So the opportunity for interactions is massive. So I thought, well, before jumping into setting up which kinds of questions should be answered or which kinds of hypothesis, uh, hypotheses should be structured, uh, the first and foremost thing would be to get a handle on the magnitude of the issue. And I think in order to do that, for the first year, uh, I would clearly see, and I have made some notes here, I would clearly see 35 to $40 million uh, for the first year in just beginning to define the research problems and the research agenda, and in the second year, 45 to 50 million uh, to begin to firm it up. But I think these are the kinds of money that we're talking about to get it started, and then conceivably $50 million a year or $100 million a year for the next 10 to 20 years as these machines begin to come on the roads. That this, is, this is a major, major, potentially, let me put it this way, potentially major disruption, major intervention to what it is we've done and we know. This is unknown, and what you have is a batch of assurances by people who are, in large measure, by people who are marketing a product. Well, sorry, but that's not good enough. Uh, I've seen people killed, and I've been an expert witness at uh, trials whereby the amount of money is between $15 million and $25 million for one person who may have been rendered a quadriplegic at age four or five as a consequence of getting hit by an automobile. So the amount of money, uh, some people may say, look, that amount of money is too small. Uh, and I'm, I'm open to being persuaded otherwise, but that would just be in the U.S. I think that the U.S. Uh, as a major player uh, should be looking into this very, very seriously. And I think numbers like 35 to 40 million, 45 to 50 million, that gets people's attention. That maybe this is something that needs to be looked at in a very serious way. And that would be, that's just the start, John. Now, who, who should be overseeing this research? Who's going to take charge of making sure that we're finding out what we need to know? Well, we need some, we need some pedestrian advocacy groups. I think this is a major role uh, for them to play. Whether there was a, uh, a pedestrian advocacy group, and by the way, there could be another group for cyclists. It's just that they're, like, they're both vulnerable, they're groups of vulnerable road users. The problem is I haven't looked at the cyclist part as well because in many ways it's a different order of problem. It's the same, it's a similar problem, but it's a different order. But I think that the, the pedestrian advocacy group should have a, a major role in defining who oversees this, who is responsible for it. I mean, I don't think it's something you would send to your National Science Foundation. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm just saying I don't know whether it would be appropriate to them. 
uh, a government agency like, for example, the National Safety Highway Transportation Administration, that could be it. The only trouble is I personally don't know their relationship with the automotive industry because you don't want somebody that is not independent of the vested interests. And let's, fear, clear, let's be clear, uh, the automotive industry is a vested interest. So they want to get these things on the road. Uh, I personally would not be prepared to say, okay, why don't you tell us what it is we need to know and why we need to know it and how we should find out how we should find out. So I think probably the advocacy group should play a major role and I'm just suggesting that one of the agencies that came to mind is the, is the, the Safety Transportation uh, Administration. That's, that's a possibility. In the U.S. I think that's a possibility. But certainly uh, the dialogue has to begin uh, and by the way I have not seen this dialogue. I mean I went through a lot of literature and I found an awful lot of you know what I would call mealy mouth or wandering around in the bush comments but nobody that I saw directly approached the problem, and I don't know anybody who's given it uh, the kind of visibility that Perils for Pedestrians would. I mean, this is a, this is a show, which, uh, you know, an interview which can be readily accessible to an awful lot of people, but I think it's a dialogue that really needs to start, and it needs to start very soon. You have to have this done before they're on the road. To my knowledge, it has not been done. And what they're doing is they're still doinking around with the technology. Well, it's amazing. It's sort of like, if you build it, they will come. Well, all of a sudden, if you build it, they will drive it. Well, whoa. First off, you better do the necessary research to justify that all of the P's and Q's have been identified and have been dotted. And the kicker here is, it's not good enough for the firms to say, look, we'll bear the liability. You killed somebody. Well, you can't bring somebody back to life. And all they're talking about is money. Money doesn't buy a life. Money doesn't recapture somebody's health if they've been hammered by a car. And there's a lot of complicated questions to be raised and, and requiring complicated answers because of the number of nuances we already have on the road. And now you're adding a relatively unknown variable to the mix. Uh, we already have complicated mixes depending on the weather. Uh, when you can't see road markings, if the lights go down, uh, somebody decides to step out, somebody, a kid runs out from a school rather than an adult, seniors don't move as quickly as somebody else, maybe they're still in the middle of the road uh, when the light changes. So there's all kinds of things that have to be looked at and every single one of those kinds of research questions has to be asked and answered because the point is what may be applicable in one municipality could be applicable in 500 others. So it's, it's a very large issue, John, very large. Do you see the issues being substantially different, uh, you know, in you know North America, Canada, and the U.S. versus someplace like New Delhi? Well, you see, this this becomes this becomes very intriguing because in some parts of the world, and with all due respect, they have no regard for signals of any kind. I mean, people used to joke about Montreal is that the the uh, traffic lights are just decorations, and so this becomes you know an interesting little bit of of, of dialogue about different kinds of municipalities. Uh, but I think that the sense would be that in develop, developed countries there is a reasonable facsimile of logic as to what it is that's supposed to happen. And we think we have a reasonable grasp on behaviors. Uh, so for personally, uh, I would be comfortable with uh, North America, that would be the U well, I, I would actually limit it to the U.S. and Canada. Those are the two with which I am the most familiar. Uh, how, but when you go to Europe even, things change. They have a different approach. They have different densities. Uh, they have much higher reliance on public transit. Uh, in some cases, you know, in any fact, they don't have much in the way of speed limits. They just say, okay, look, you're a smart person, figure out how fast you should go. Well, that's not exactly how I would approach traffic in North America. Uh, with all due respect, again, to my American and, and Canadian colleagues and, uh, and fellow travelers. So I think that the autonomous vehicle is probably most likely uh, to take place in the United States and to some degree in Canada because of the intertwined nature of the automotive industry. And therein lies, the, to some degree, the rub. This is being driven by vested interests. I mean, Google is not doing this as a contribution to charity. Google is doing this for Google. And if I'm wrong, I'm sure Google will sort me out in no, end, in no uncertain terms and very, very quickly. But I don't think this is curiosity-driven research on the part of Google. I think that Google is doing this to improve uh, its core offerings and they know better than I do what their core offerings are but I don't think Google or other corporations do this 
just to be good neighbors. They're doing it for money. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, in more ways than one, it's the money. So from that point of view, there is a reasonably well integrated. Now, whether autonomous vehicles would work in Mexico, I'm no expert. I have no idea whether they would or they wouldn't, uh, what the response to them would be. And the other worry you have is uh, we need to be careful about arrogance. Uh, you need to be careful about thinking you can export technology somewhere. And I think that we have a pretty good record of looking at the interactions, the relationships between pedestrians and uh, uh, private motor vehicles in the United States and in Canada. Uh, we know there's dramatic room for improvement there, particularly as the, from the point of view of pedestrians being uh, vulnerable road users. And the interesting part is they have always been vulnerable road users. Uh, it's not clear that their state of vulnerability has improved one iota in the past 20 years. I mean, they're still getting whacked uh, by automobiles. And you would think, okay, if we had a sense of logic and we understood the significance of what happens when you get hit by a car, we'd be an awful lot more careful. So I don't know the extent to which uh, deaths and injuries of pedestrians have gone down uh, more or less around the block all over North America at all times of the year. I think there's still room for improvement with regard to our treatment of vulnerable road users, and I'm talking about pedestrians, I would add cyclists if the opportunity arose. But we're dealing with pedestrians, and I think that we have uh, a, considerable amount, a considerable amount of work to do of different kinds, and I don't think that question has been dealt with. I don't really think it's gotten much in the way of attention. And as I said earlier, it's like if you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will buy it, they will drive it. And the argument will be, well, they're already here. Uh, why didn't you ask these questions a long time ago? Well, we're asking the questions now. And my hope is that advocacy groups, pedestrian advocacy groups, will pick up on this interview and they will ask the questions. They're the ones who, perhaps given this heads up, will be the ones who begin to really stir the pot. And I think clearly they have to go the political route. I don't think talking to industry is going to be all that popular. I doubt very much that GM and Ford and Nissan and Toyota and Honda uh, and Google are going to be all that interested in hearing about the impact on pedestrians. I think they're going to have to go the, the, the full, the, do the full body in effect, municipal, state and federal representatives. I think that's the route they're going, definitely going to have to go and soon, very soon. We're in Washington, D.C., talking with Chris Zimmerman, who's Vice President for Economic Development for Smart Growth America. What is Smart Growth America? Smart Growth America is a national organization that works to promote better neighborhoods and uh, more compact development and better transportation choices for people and better housing opportunities all around the country. Who do you work with in the course of pursuing your mission? We work with a lot of local governments. We work sometimes with regional governments like uh, uh, MPOs. We work with state governments. Um, some work at the federal level, but mostly it's on the ground in localities uh, all around the country. You just came out with a new report. What was it? Well, one of our most recent uh, publications is uh, Rebuilding Downtown, which is a guide for uh, revitalizing downtowns, basically. Uh, by downtowns, we mean both the sense of, uh, you know, legacy downtowns, the old-fashioned Main Street that a lot of places have that had been in decline in the 20th century and now have a chance to have a new life. But we also mean places that were never downtowns really uh, but became, you know, suburban economic centers uh, that uh, uh, were successful for a long time, uh, may have had shopping malls and, you know, other kinds of uh, drive-oriented shopping centers uh, that uh, have a chance to have some new life. Uh, as walkable places and will emerge uh, as walkable places. And basically it's intended to help people, mostly local officials, who are trying to find a way to take advantage of the tremendous wave we're seeing of change that is creating opportunity for walkable places. That's where the economic development of this country seems to be moving more and more to, uh, to places that are walkable, whether they are center, you know, central business districts in uh, major cities. Uh, or older towns that surround them, or new emerging suburban areas that are becoming walkable places. Walkability seems to be the key to successful economic development in the 21st century. So almost any sort of environment in the, in the United States, there'd be some place 
that could be a walkable center? Is that uh, sort of the conclusion you come to? Yeah, I, th I think that the, the principles that are involved here work almost anywhere at almost any scale. So we're seeing whether we're talking about, you know, great big cities, uh, you know, the New York, Chicago, San Francisco's, or small towns. Uh, there's a great demand for walkable small towns now. Uh, many people want to live in a smaller place, uh, but they very much want to be in a place where they're close to things, where they have, you know, easy proximity to services they need, where they don't have to spend a lot of time commuting by car, uh, and they want walkable environments. They want places that have a sense of place, that feel like a place you want to be. And small towns can achieve that, medium-sized places. The biggest challenge really is the vast uh, suburban areas we have around our, our metropolitan areas in the country where, you know, for decades we were building at a very fast pace and a very large scale these entirely auto-dependent communities, places where, you know, you can't do anything without getting in a car. And those are, uh, those are you know, more challenging to transform, um, and many of them are struggling now as they're so overbuilt that uh, in many places they're, they're not so economically competitive, whether we're talking about, you know, tracts of housing that were built before the crash that, you know, can't be sold now in these sort of zombie subdivisions you hear about, uh, or if we're talking about office parks, which, you know, in the latter part of the 20th century, the suburban office park was the prestige address for business. Um, now it's not, and a lot of them are liable not to be viable uh, going forward. Um, more and more we're seeing a reversal of the 20th century pattern and businesses looking for downtown areas to locate. Or if not literally downtown in the sense of, of the central business district, moving to places that are on transit and that are in walkable environments. We released a study in June called Core Values that was a study of this, this trend, this change in, in uh, business location decision. Uh, in recent years, we mapped uh, close to 500 uh, instances in the years uh, 2010, basically 2015, basically the last five years, all since the since the crash, and uh, you know found uh, businesses of all sizes, including many Fortune 500 companies, relocating from suburban office park type environments, uh, including some very prestigious places, uh, to uh, downtowns of one kind or another. Uh, and one of the things we found was that. Uh, when we analyzed the data, we, we applied walk score, if you're familiar with that, which is a measure of walkability of a location um, on the website, walkscore.com. And uh, when we put the addresses in for the previous location and the new location, we found that there was a 36% rise in walkability. Uh, so it was pretty clear uh, that, uh, you know, that's what was going on here. That there was, the transit uh, score was similarly uh, jumped uh, a comparable amount. So, you know, when, when you interview the, the folks as we did, you know, we, we interviewed many of the companies and said, you know, why did you choose to move where you did? Uh, what came through was they wanted these more walkable, transit-accessible locations because uh, more than ever, business depends now in the, in the knowledge economy that is sort of what drives uh, business in the 21st century. Uh, more than ever, they're dependent upon attracting creative talent. And the creative talent wants to live in these places. So they're finding it necessary to move to such places to be able to be competitive in attracting the workforce they want. And that's what we heard over and over again when we talked to, to the business leaders who had to make these location decisions. And businesses interested in moving to compact, walkable places, uh, what are the implications for you know, local and state governments when, when you change development patterns like that? Well, the, the one level, it's a, a question of how you pursue economic development. You know, in the 20th century, economic development as a government activity was a lot about trying to attract, you know, the big manufacturer, the big corporate headquarters, maybe the big shopping center, usually by providing things like tax incentives, where you're basically paying them to come, uh, or subsidizing infrastructure that was viewed as critical to their location decision. And that kind of Infrastructure was typically a new highway or a new interchange or a new ramp off the highway uh, because these were all going to auto-oriented locations. Uh, and that was what you did to get, you know, to build your tax base. Um, that's not going to be so effective anymore. And the kind of infrastructure you need is very different. If what they want is a revitalized downtown, then you've got to figure out how you do that, which is why we, you know, issued the guide uh, rebuilding downtown. Uh, if you you know, want to have a place that is attractive to companies thinking about where they, where they want to locate, then you've got to have a place that is attractive to the type of people they want to hire. 
So in terms of infrastructure, you're looking at things like transit. Uh, you're looking at all the things that go to creating a walkable place, which means obviously sidewalks, but the whole sidewalk environment, you know, is it, is it a place where people actually want to walk, where they kind of want to be, where they want to hang out? And, uh, you know, that leads you to look at things like, you know, what are our public spaces like? What is the, you know, if we have, if we have plazas, are they attractive places that actually do uh, literally attract people? Um, if not, why? What are we doing wrong? Uh, when you look at the, the sort of interface between the private space and the public space, which is basically the street wall where the building, you know, the private building meets the public street, you know, are, do we have blank walls uh, or do we have active retail doors and windows and people coming and going, uh, the kind of thing that gives a place a, a sense of place and makes people feel like that's a safe place to be. I want to be there. Uh, so you have to look at a lot of these kind of things that have to do with creating the built environment that supports a walkable life. And uh, you have to look, you know, on a, at a higher level, if you're a larger place, you have to look at public transportation. And uh, if you're giving people alternatives to the automobile, are you bicycle friendly? Because, again, that's part of it, especially with uh, the, the generation that is the, you know, now dominant part of the workforce, um, the millennial generation, younger people in their 20s and 30s, uh, who much more than earlier generations are uh, interested in walking and biking, uh, like to be outside at least some of the time, uh, are not as interested in spending time in their automobiles as, say, my generation was. And if we look back in time and sort of, you know, skip the baby boomer years and go back, you know, a century, uh, you know, cities, you know, before, you know, even in the early days of the automobile, cities were built as walkable places. Uh, are, yeah. are we sort of going back to the future? What's... Uh, yeah, it pretty much is. Um, you know, it is pretty much that. Uh, we're rediscovering the way human beings built cities, you know, from the time civilization started, whatever that was, 10 or 20,000 years ago. Um, if you look at, you know, ancient cities and any of the records we have, you know, they built places that were walkable on grid patterns, you know, thousands of years ago. And you know, there are reasons for that um, that have to do with the, you know, ergonomics and the, you know, the physicality of, of, of human beings. And uh, the way we the way we live and the way we get around, because of course before uh, really the middle of the 20th century, most people had to get around everywhere by walking. You know, there even though cars had existed for a while, most people didn't have them, and that was only for a short period. And horses basically were for outside of town, and horses were also very valuable. Most people didn't have them, so you know for the most part you had to build places where people could walk to everything they needed, and they just naturally arose that way. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.